Hello and welcome to the NEA Big Read Central Florida. My name is Shannon Lindsay and I'm the UCF Art Gallery Director and one of the organizers of the NEA Big Read Central Florida. An initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest, the NEA Big Read broadens our understanding of our world, our communities, and ourselves through the joy of sharing a good book. The University of Central Florida is one of 75 nonprofit organizations to receive a grant to host an NEA Big Read project this year. The UCF College of Arts and Humanities, in association with Seminole County Public Libraries and the Veterans Legacy Program, is offering programming including this series of virtual artist talks in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the publication of Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. Published in 1990, The Things They Carried is a collection of linked short stories about a platoon of American soldiers fighting on the ground in the Vietnam War. Based on the author's experience as a soldier in the 23rd Infantry Division, with many of the characters sharing similarities with those in O'Brien's 1973 memoir, If I Die in a <coughs> Zone, Box Me Up and Ship Me Home. The Things They Carried explores the genre of metafiction and blurs the lines between fiction and nonfiction. Inspired by The Things They Carried, this series of talks asks artists to consider the ways we respond to war. Can art adequately respond to war? How do artists represent the unrepresentable? Today, we are pleased to welcome Sisavan Putavong, a professor of painting in the Department of Art and Design at Middle Tennessee State University. Her work has been included in numerous international exhibitions and is in the permanent collection of the Hunter Museum of American Art and the American Embassy in Suriname. Today, we are pleased to have Sisavan with us to discuss her work, which seeks to raise awareness of the history of the American bombing of Laos and, advocate, and to advocate for the clearance of unexploded bombs. Today, the talk via Zoom will be structured as follows. The artist presentation will be approximately 30 minutes. We will hold 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. Attendees videos and microphones are set <coughs> off, but please type your questions in the chat box to the right. And I will ask as many of the questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Thank you all for joining us for today's presentation. And now I'd like to turn it over to Sisavan Putavan. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I want to say hello to everyone who decided to um, get on Zoom and be part of this conversation. And thank you to um, University of Central Florida for giving me the platform. Uh, I think as I was um, uh, looking through the book a little bit, I, I haven't read Tim O'Brien's book, but the things they carried. Uh, one of the things that I thought was very important was um, uh, one of the I think the comments was they carried the sky um, and and I thought that was really interesting um, and also the conversation around can art adequately respond to war and how do artists represent the unrepresentable. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory of myself because that informs um, uh, directly and influences my artwork. So I'm not going to give you a um, a Vietnam War history because I am not a history professor and um, so I'm responding to the Vietnam War in terms of my own experience and the aftermath of it. So I was born in Laos in 1976 um, in Vien Chan. I was the youngest of seven. Um, I have five older brothers and a sister. My dad uh, was a medic and worked for the Red Cross uh, during the Vietnam War and then helped out during the refugee uh, camps. I'll talk a little bit about that. My mom was a stay-at-home mom and she was a weaver. Um, my brothers went to French schools and universities uh, and life was okay, but we all knew that, you know, we had to leave. So between 76 and 78, um, during that time, the Pet That Lao, the communist group, was trying to re-educate everyone who was part of the Vietnam War. And because my father worked directly with the Red Cross um, and the Americans, he uh, was forced to leave his home. And so we had to uh, cross the Mekong River um, and um, in a, a horrible state where, you know, one of my brother almost drowned. We crossed over to the Nong Khai refugee camp and um, at that time, um, they took my father away and my, um, and I was crying the whole time in the camps and they said, well, we either shoot her 
or um, uh, so she will stop crying um, or we release the father. And so they released my father, um, thankfully, and we ended up in uh, the Nankai refugee camp for two years. Um, so in that two years, uh, uh, he worked uh, in the hospital and helped out with the sanitation and things like that. And then my brothers uh, would help the family by um, buying ice cream and selling it on the streets. And I remember vaguely and my sister telling me the story of us eating melted ice cream. And that was uh, quite the fond memory. And I think being two-ish, I don't think I remember much at all. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of my experience and my memories because they're very, um, not scattered, but they're very fuzzy. Uh, so the stories that I've heard are through my parents and sisters and things like that. And so I'm basing a lot of my work and my feelings and things like that, kind of how they have felt in terms of that time period. Um, so right before we actually a couple weeks ago I was going through some paperwork and I found the letter that uh, in my father's wallet literally um, that was written by uh, I think one of his one of his colleagues that we needed a letter so we can get out of the refugee camp to move to Kansas to <clears throat> so I wanted to read you this letter because I thought it was so important especially relating it to Tim O'Brien's it says um, to whom it may concern, Mr. Maypon Putavong, even though this man was a Lao trained medic, he was responsible for setting up the US aid uh, medical program in Samnia province, um, where he was in charge of recovering and uh, dis distributing drugs to over 25 displaced um, uh, and dangerous areas. <clears throat> he was also used he was also uh, used very much in recovery and first aid treatment down U.S. Uh, uh, pilots in Samnia with North Vietnam. So he was a medic and, um, and would go in and, and help the, uh, the U.S. soldiers when they were down. During the years 63, 64, 65, he was, the, um, he was a paid worker and a doctor. So it's a very fuzzy if you can look at the screen like I could barely make out some of the the text um, but one of the part that I wanted you it says he remained behind to protect the U.S. interests knowing that we would return thanks Mr. Pope Bull um, uh, I asked one more time and so so obviously he asked him to write a letter and I think he wrote another letter because the letter then um, says, I asked one more time, this man helped save many American lives. Um, maybe, um, uh, it says, maybe you don't give a shit, um, but because of men like this, many American pilots live, maybe you would rather see the Jane Fonda lived please, Mr. Pope. So I think in reading this, it gave me sh like uh, goosebumps because it was written in January 29th, 1979. And we um, uh, left uh, uh, Nankai to Kansas in uh, April 29th of uh, 1980. And so him having to write a letter to get us out of the refugee camp to then immigrate to the United States, I was just um, very emotional. Um, so the next thing was our flight from San Francisco to Kansas. And if you can see on the right is a photograph of a lady, an African-American lady who took photos with her Polaroid. And, um, and those were the only <clears throat> photos that we had from the trip. And any of these photos, because all of our photos were burnt during one of the, uh, during the uh, Nankai refugee, they had a, uh, a fire and so all of uh, any of the photos I had of myself as a kid was gone so these are um, these are very kind of precious uh, photographs that I you know I can't believe this amazing woman um, you know took photos and then gave them to us um, 
So <clears throat> we ended up in Caney, Kansas in 1980. And these photographs actually, or this one in particular, is from uh, a newspaper writer who was taking photographs of the refugees who uh, immigrated to Caney, Kansas. Um, because Caney was such a small town, we ended up in Winfield, Kansas, which is north of Caney, and it was about a population of 10,000. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how, you know, the influence of not the aftermath of war and how it's influenced families. Um, so looking at the photograph onto the left, it is such a representation of the, uh, the Laotian and the American. You've got this, you know, a quilt like shirt with, you know, the Laotian textile and here me looking like a doll and the Christmas tree. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the 1.5 generation. Um, I didn't know too much about the 1.5 generation until uh, Chanita, whom I'm going to talk about a little bit later, um, is using it as our uh, the title for the show at the Minnesota, Minnesota Museum of American Art. Um, so the 1.5 generation, if you don't know anything about it, I'm going to read a little bit here, are individuals who immigrate to a new country before or during their early teens. They earn the label the 1.5 generation because they bring with them or maintain characteristics from their home country, meanwhile engaging in assimilation and so socialization with their new country. It was coined by Ruben Rambat, a sociology professor at the UC Irvine um, and a Cuban immigrant, a Cuban American who immigrated as a child. He defines the 1.5 generation as stuck in between cultures as they are not quite first generation, but not quite second generation citizens. The duality between cultures and having to mediate for parents in everyday situation was exhausting and isolating. And so that fit me to the T. Um, that was exactly uh, my world, um, the, the uh, culture between the Laotian culture um, and, and, you know, learning the, the, not only the culture, but as trying to assimilate into American culture, learning English at the same time as I was speaking Laotian fluently in the household. Um, I was constantly, you know, having to um, go in and, and help my uh, parents, you know, mediate and things like that with, uh, um, with, with society as a whole, um, but also going to social Laotian gatherings and things like that. So I want to say that nobody really talked about the Vietnam War um, or its impact on Laos in my house. Um, my father, though, was one of the, I think, the few, and, and, and again, it's really hard to extract anything from from at least my parents. Um, and so he, he was part of a small group that was trying to make Laos better. So he would have these small little meetings. I didn't understand what they were. And, and I think it was to generate income to help, I don't know if it was overthrow um, the government or to help maybe make Laos better. So that was kind of my world as a kid is, um, you know, going to these Laotian events and then seeing my father advocate for his country and then trying to be American and, uh, you know, and, and there was a love hate relationship there. Um, so I'm going to go to the, uh, so jumping through from a very small little town in Winfield, Kansas, I ended up at the University of Kansas. Um, I initially was a biochem major. I wanted to be a doctor like my father, but switched to art instead because of my, my love to create. And so I was making work that was um, highly, influences, highly influenced by uh, this, this kind of cross-cultural identity, uh, this diaspora and displacement and trying to figure out who I was and what does this all mean. So I felt as though a lot of my work was starting to become a little bit like the, um, <clears throat> um, the expressionists really utilizing materials and paint in such a way that was reflecting my uh, experiences and also the emotions that I was going through in terms of a 1.5 generation. Um, so, but during that time, I met some amazing professor, uh, 
both of whom uh, was surprisingly Chinese, Norman G and um, Pak Chi Lao. One was a photographer and one was a painter. And so they were working about identity as well, not exactly like mine, but they were such an influence in my work. Um, so I was starting to make um, installation and sculpture pieces that were based on um, figuring out who I was. And again, going back to the idea of identity, um, playing with performances and, and things like that. So already at a very young age, I, was, I wasn't directing, directly making work about war, but in a, in a sense more of the experience and the aftermath and how it's resonated into my, my life as a whole. And I couldn't really, I couldn't really get away from it. And it wasn't really a question of, you know, I'm a Laotian American, it, that was part of me and I couldn't disassociate myself from it. So one is lost the faith and the other one is mom weaving. Um, as I, uh, as I, uh, well, I'm gonna kind of jump. So I went from undergrad and then I went to grad school and grad school was, um, a lot of, I gave birth to my first daughter. I would suggest students not to have a kid during grad school because it's crazy. I met amazing people in graduate schools from all over the country and still really good friends with them. Um, I was making performance installations. Um, my work though, during that time um, was really dealing with uh, really dealing with what it meant to be as a new mom and also how do I bring this bring up this little girl who is part Caucasian her father who's a sculptor and me who is Laotian and how do I start embedding those kind of qualities that she is <clears throat> she is part of two cultures and so my work revolved around her, but, it's, but it also revolved around the senses. Um, uh, and, and because she was born um, August 30th, uh, right before 9-11 happened, for us, it was a very cloudy moment because um, everything was going a little crazy. Uh, people were afraid of their neighbors. We would see this on TV. The evening news was, you know, constantly uh, uh, having these stories that were talking about how the neighbors were, you know, they were scared of each other. And it really, um, it really influenced my work. I created a piece that was talking about food and how we didn't question the chefs behind the, you know, the door and that um, really thinking about how food and culture and how um, we perceive all of that stuff, but really not questioning um, in a sense, um, uh, you know, uh, who's making the food for you? And, um, and another thing I always tell my students too is that get better photos because I can't find that one. Um, anyway, so some of the, you know, even during that time, there were a lot of racist comments as well as I was going to, um, while I was in undergrad and walking to school. Um, I actually think that was, I had more racial comments during that time and it could be because of 9-11. And so again, this impact from external things and just thinking that I'm Laotian and sometimes I forget that I'm Laotian um, and you know, and I'm just going about my business. Um, but again, going back to the identity issue and figuring out who I am as a person. So, I got a job straight away after graduate school and the first piece that I made um, was a, a displacement series. It's the American citizenship um, in 2004 in um, Huntsville, Alabama. Um, there are 11 total pieces of these. They range from two by three. But anyway, these are basically talking a little bit about how the Laotians came into another country and, um, and changed their first names. So this is actually my brother here. Um, his name is Kump Gil, but he changed it to Chris uh, to make it a lot easier for people to you know, say his name. Uh, here's a close up of the Bende dots um, um, coined by Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, but uh, so these are all individual dots playing upon the idea that we are still individuals, even though we have become like pop art, very American. And so that was kind of the symbolism for this work. And it was big and bright colors that I normally didn't use, but I wanted people to see that that's what American I America is. And you know, it's the Campbell soups and the Lichtensteins. And, and so that was one of the works that I thought was very poignant in my career 
Um, I haven't gone back to it, uh, but, uh, but I was really happy to have worked on it. Jumping <coughs> forward a little bit, um, between those 2005 and 2016, you're like, how did she go from 2004 to 2016? Um, well, I was pretty busy. I had two young kids. I was making collaborative work with my husband, who's a sculptor. Um, we were questioning um, the earth because there were so many natural disasters during that time. We were also, uh, I was also making work that was about huge business scandals. Um, and if you go to my website, you'll see hummingbirds and you'll see insects and wasps and their huge mass of paintings. Um, so we were really in that stage, at least I was, not really making work about you know, identity in a sense, but more of how we perceive our landscape and that type of identity. Um, so it manifested itself into uh, huge bronze sculpture pieces and um, aluminum pieces <coughs> and some encaustic and things like that. So it was called a spring collection. Um, and then we jumped to 2016. You see me with my, my Laotian hat and my beer lao. And next to me is Brian Theo Warrior. And he is a, a poet laureate, an amazing um, facilitator and a community leader. Uh, he found me online and I had no idea who any of these people were. And he was like, you know what? There's a, a Lao Rider Summit in San Diego. You should come. You can be part of the, uh, the, the artist uh, panel down below. Um, this is an image on the top here is of, um, of the second Lao Rider Summit in 2017. But what he did for me by inviting me to not only show my work, but to talk about my work, I, it opened up um, just my world in terms of meeting all of these artists, performances, poets and dancers and storytellers and um, just, you know, these professional Laotian artists I didn't know that was out there. Because I lived in such a small town in Winfield, Kansas, literally population of 10,000, I didn't get to immerse myself in a larger community like they did in San Diego or Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and so I didn't know any of these people out there. So I met, <coughs> so I met Chanapa and she's right here. And this is actually a photo from 2017 um, fundraiser, but I have been um, helping out with some of the like donating artwork and 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 just supporting them since 2016 legacy of war so this was my first time in terms of really knowing exactly you know what what is legacy of war what is the secret war of laos you don't get taught that in the history books it's not something that you know um i flip through and realize oh that's i am part of that uh i my husband is a history buff and so i've heard it but i haven't really researched enough to understand it and so so she went up during the San Diego Lao Rider Summit and gave this most amazing speech about, um, about Legacy of War. It's a nonprofit um, and uh, she's not running it right now. Um, uh, another person is, but she made such a, a impact on my life and really questioning um, myself about um, how, how can I contribute to the cause? Um, how can I give my time to it? And one thing she said to me that sometimes it, um, when people are asking me to do something, it leaves me a bad taste, but she said, you know what, do it on your time and when you are ready. And sometimes Laotians can be a little pushy. And so when she said that to me, I said, you know what, she's right. I can do this on my own time and when I'm ready. And so it opened the doors um, for me to create a body of work that was based on legacy of war's mission to help the removal of bombs in Laos. And I'm gonna get to that a little bit more. Um, so over from, uh, this is a little bit of info, there's so much more out there. Um, and I'll talk more about it later, but, uh, U.S. from 64 to 73, the U.S. dropped more than 2 million tons of ordnance on Laos, 580,000 bombing missions, um, uh, the plane loads of bomb every eight minutes, 24 hours for nine years. So people were used to bombs being, you know, dropped on them constantly. Um, mainly the bombs were along the trail of the Ho Chi Minh Trail to kind of keep the area, the supplies and things like that from not going into that area. Um, 
over today, there's over 20,000 people have been killed or injured since the bombing, since the Vietnam War, and there tends to be other people there that they are still helping to support and make sure that they still have a good livelihood because of it. Um, 41, I think, out of 45 provinces has, they have um, the unexploded ordnance all over, and so I did one of the um, per capita thing, but I'm from Tennessee or live here. It would mean that most of Tennessee would be bombed. So think about that, that you would walk outside and your whole front lawn would be full of these little bomblets that your kids might pick up. And so this just made such an impact on my life. Um, and uh, so for you know it's going to be the 45th year anniversary coming up so there's uh, i'm going to talk a little bit about the show that i am uh going to be a part of um but she chanapa has helped raise uh well they don't get the money the people in laos get the money to help um uh, get rid of the, the unexploded ordinance, but over 70 million. Um, it started, I think, around 3 million, and now it's 70 million. And she asked, well, why are we getting, why are you not giving us enough money? Um, and one of the congressmen said, well, nobody asked. And so because of her voice for the community, um, Laos is slowly starting to rebuild itself, but it'll take a very long time to get rid of all of those bombs. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go back a little bit. So after I've met all these people, and I'm going chronologically because it helps me with B, it also kind of solidifies the story a little bit. I, it, so I met all these people, Legacy of War, and I get a sabbatical and I go to Laos. So I taught two weeks in Phuket, and then um, I wanted to see where the Nong Khai refugee camp, and this is what I came, this is basically what the Nong Khai refugee camp, it's actually a very large area. There are police division buildings there, land development buildings there, military houses, wooden lots now makes up the refugee camp now in Thailand. So it's not there anymore. Um, but what I was kind of interested in as I was there for my sabbatical is I interviewed a bunch of people about their experience with the Nong Khai refugee camp. I get a little bit of the stories in terms of my experience or my brother experience, experiences in the refugee camp, but I was kind of curious since I was there, you know, what, what were their stories? And, um, and they were, some of them were builders, salesmen, some of them were lovers and things like that, and which I thought was really interesting. It became I visualize as a kid, it's a camp, you know, and it's horrible, but I, but it actually became a community where people were in and out. Um, and, and I thought that was kind of interesting and just their stories and connecting with them was, it was really important to me as well. Um, <laughs> it was a very busy year in 2016 and 17. So I had a solo show. I had to put all this work together before actually I left for Thailand for a month. And the war, I, I was trying to debate on what I was going to call this. And I ended up calling it Legacy of War. And I knew once I, I titled it Legacy of War that there's going to be this explosion of questions. But I like Chana Posset in your own time. And I felt like it was my time as an artist um, to start making work that was reflecting myself again and my identity and my displacement. Um, but also thinking about all the stories that uh, are not very different from mine, uh, from um, other immigrants, other refugees. Um, so this is the show at Tenney Contemporary Gallery in Nashville. Um, the works, and I titled them fairly blatantly because what I realized is nobody knew where Laos was. Nobody knew anything about the secret war because it really was a secret war. Um, so this is a really big painting. It's a legacy of war, unexplored ordinance. This was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I was, so going back to my abstract years, I was, I was really thinking about the explosion, implosion, the way that structurally things were crumbling and falling down. A lot of these pieces were um, influenced by my travel, but also um, taking in uh, smaller pieces, collaging smaller pieces of uh, both images from the Vietnam War, literally offline, and then abstracting them, putting them back into this, um, the Photoshop and reformatting them and then pushing space and depth. And really thinking about, as I'm making these pieces, 
um, it's kind of discombobulating, it's confusing because that's exactly what a refugee feels like when they come to a new country. And I think of, <coughs> excuse me, of my mom who had to learn um, English and I, I can't even imagine going to another country and, um, and raising my family and trying to keep it together. Um, so this, uh, after the show there, I had another piece, this was for, um, uh, the, I proposed a piece for the airport show and, uh, and I wanted a big piece. So this is a 16 feet wide by eight feet tall. Um, and the question is, well, well, why, right? Why are you making such a big piece? Well, I was, I wasn't going to shy away from scale. I wanted a bigger voice. I didn't want to be missed. I didn't want it to be a secret. And I thought, how fitting was it to put this piece at the airport and all these people coming through and if they read it they read it if not they they are hopefully being grabbed by the bright colors the the shapes and the size and the scale of it so i figure as an artist my first job is to try to get the audience into my space and actually look a little deeper and that's what i was trying to do with these pieces that are very massive and very large um, <clears throat> here's the scale of the work you can see how big it is uh, and then uh, at the same time, later on that year, I was asked by Nandini um, Makrandi. She's the curator at the Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga. And um, she, she, um, she asked the um, artists to make work, but the works had to all be done during that year. So they all had to be new. And I was hustling and, and I thought, oh my God, how am I gonna get all this done? Um, but it was such a, a wonderful opportunity to be part of that show. Um, and here is uh, the piece that is in the permanent collection now. Um, these are still based off drawing inspiration from uh, my experience as a refugee, um, the feeling of, you know, being being lost in space not really understanding you know do do i fit in do i not fit in um these kind of puzzle like things that kind of form together but yet they don't they don't really quite fit and i've i've always have felt that way as an artist as a person is though you know i can go back to laos and they actually see me as a foreigner even though i speak laotian fluently i can be here in the united states and and some people would still see me as an immigrant and as a refugee and so in a sense there's not a real home for me so these are all kind of made in a modular sense here's an installation shots of how big the pieces are they're all made in a modular sense because I was kind of talking about how um, we are kind of like nomads, um, shifting from one place to the other and really not really finding root. Um, and I wanted to show how big this was. This is my family uh, and uh, just the massive scale of the work uh, was again, really important for me. Um, here's the, I call it the egg piece, but it actually reminds me a lot about the lotus, which is also one of the memories that I have as a kid um, and really thinking about, again, the religion that I grew up with, with which is Theravada Buddhism, which is the oldest form of Buddhism. Um, and so really speaking about my religion, my kind of disconnect with it, but also connection with it. Um, and so, let me go on. <clears throat> and these are some of my lovely colleagues, uh, Kimberly Dummons and, and Kathy O'Connell, who were, who were there to support me as well. Um, so a lot of these pieces, again, was really questioning, I'm going to go back to that, was, again, wanting the viewer to be part of the work. And, and one of the things that I remember was uh, a guy came to the show and he was a Vietnam vet. And, and I had this amazing conversation with him. And I had another show at uh, Lauren Rogers Museum of Art in Mississippi. And another, a couple of Vietnam veterans came and spoke to me about how, how they thought my work was so important and, and um, you know, the conversations that we were having. And I thought, you know what, that's exactly what I'm trying to do is open up this kind of conversation space where we can talk, where the veterans can talk to the refugees and the immigrant. And we're not yelling at whose fault is it, you know, and why are you here? And I thought, 
that's what my work is about is is at the end of the day it's about these conversations we have and these open dialogues where it's not pointing fingers at anybody but that's exactly what war does to anybody or a country is that it continues and it resonates and it, it just keeps going um <clears throat> um, I just had a show at Tenny Contemporary. It's called The Infinite Monsoon, which I thought was kind of interesting based off of the Tim O'Brien's book as well. Um, these pieces uh, were put together within a year. Um, and uh, these are the scattered, uh, uh, I call it scattered box, but it's, they're, they're bomblets. And so uh, the stuff down below here, and I'm going to show you a detail of that. Uh, so these are one of, I would like to say, a shape of one of the bomblets that you would actually find out into the field all over Laos. Um, and I made them, I had this whole conversation with my husband, I made them um, colorful and plastic-like because I want to raise the awareness that um, the young victims are kids, mainly kids who are out there who are thinking these as toys. And yes, they look kind of Chinese manufactured and prefabbed. And that's exactly how I felt about them. And making so many of these, I realized that I, I, I couldn't, again, going back to imagine how this beautiful landscape uh, Laos being just, you know, you know, having all these scattered everywhere. So farmers can't farm, kids can't play. And so um, if you notice in each of them is the, there's a laser engrave, it's 2 million drop stating how many that were dropped on Laos. And I wanted to make that impact in terms of multiplicity and also the use of bright colors to, again, to evoke and provoke and, and have the audience to really question these little beautiful forms and they're reflective of it. So if you look at it, you can actually see a reflection of yourself a bit, but also the continuous flow of the bombs that they are scattered everywhere. Um, I don't know if this is gonna play, but I wanted to kind of show you the laser engraving and really it becoming such a permanent thing for myself as a as a immigrant that you know i can't detach from it um let's see i'm gonna go to disillusioned these pieces um were i wanted to make the work for this uh, infinite monsoon uh that was a little bit more i'd like to say didactic or to the point um and and basically each of the the pieces uh from t up to down says this basically goes eight minutes 24 hours for nine years 270 million bombed um and that was really important for me to put the text to, to, to put the the numbers on there because again if people come up and look at them they might question it they might read the title um but also the flow the verticality of the the stripes in the um the use of the tape and the resin was to make these solid to make this like this is part of history this is solidifying that this is not a secret war this is part of my past it's part of your past and so and again this constant reminder of of um what can happen and so uh again this this idea of them becoming up and down is is just resonating again about how the bombs are falling <coughs> quantified tactical zone I, this one in particular it's a, a bigger piece it's nine panels they come apart um uh, and if you look up close to the left the parts of the each of the individual paintings have a bit of a glitch to them i want to talk a, a little bit about the topographical um but uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit in terms of these pieces, the mass chaos and the war on Laos, but also that the, the glitches become uh, hidden turmoil, secrecies, and language barrier uh, once entered in a foreign country as a refugee. So these little bits and pieces talk about the miscommunication and language. Um, that I still have. I still mispronounce things. I put S's on everything and my students are wonderful because they're like, we get it, Sisavon. Um, so these pieces in particular is, is really talking about, again, it's topographical, it's very map-like, it plays upon, um, you know, the idea of a landscape, but also in a sense, this miscommunication and language barrier. 
Um, these pieces uh, are, this is called Rain. It's uh, literally 80 small pieces, collage pieces that I put together. Um, there are 80 million cluster bomblets that did not detonate after 270 million were dropped. And so um, put together, and again, this vertical kind of play on the, the, the tape um, is allowing for it to create this kind of gravitational pull and going up from down and really pushing the idea of rain, whether rain is symbolizing tears or rain symbolizing washing away the secret wars or washing away, you know, um, our culture and assimilation. I mean, there's so much with this piece that I didn't realize when I started it, all the hidden meanings in it. Um, and here's some details of them. Um, and, and honestly, they are created by used palettes that I actually use for the larger paintings. Um, they become kind of like a disregard, disregarded materials, but really I felt like that was kind of like my life at times. And how do you then make something that gets disregarded to something that's more beautiful and has a bit, a, a bit more content and concept into it? Um, Indirect traffic is a series of body of work that I've been working on for some time now. Um, they are created by small little fragments of, uh, of wood and then resin on top and painted on top as well. I was kind of playing with the notion or the idea of them, the, these shapes that don't quite fit in again, trying to fit a round peg into a square peg kind of idea. Um, again, trying to maybe symbolize, trying to fit in within a culture. So all these little things for me start to really resonate, uh, going back to displacement and identity again. Um, <coughs> Moving Mountains is a very personal piece for me. This is a piece that was, um, it's on canvas and all these little fragments are collected uh, fabric that my mom collected for me because I'm an art student. I said, hey mom, and this is back in undergrad. So I've had the collection of Laotian discarded fabric from dresses and things like that were made and shirts and that she had, uh, had made and had the tailors make for her. Um, and so it, it's talking a lot about the safety of home, but also creating home and how much of an uphill battle it must have been for her. Um, and, and just trying to hold on to the culture for us and trying to get us to be part of it. And as a kid, I was a very stubborn kid. Um, uh, uh, back then, the women uh, would not really eat with the, their husbands, they would eat in the kitchen. And so I would force myself onto my father's lap and be, you know, and say, hey, I am part of this group. And, and he would shoo me away. And so um, the, the cultural barrier, this kind of disconnect that I have, but the connection, um, the emotional kind of turmoil that I have with my own culture, I'm, I'm trying to kind of face them again with within my own time frame. Um, these pieces in particular is about, it's called Unstable, and I was um, highly influenced by images that, um, the, the Vietnam War images, but also images from the conflict with Turkey and the Kurds and the bombing in Syria. So as I was going through the, the images online, I'm, I'm realizing that, you know, there's not really a big difference uh, in terms of from one refugee, from one immigrant, their experience. Yes, there are the, the details and things like that, but in a sense, it's, it's all about this crumbling, you know, this unstableness, this foundation falling right under your feet, the spilling away of these fragments and forms and, and trying to figure things out. And I think that since I'm a mom and, and I, I can't even imagine having to raise my family in that type of condition. And so I wanted to kind of give homage to what is happening today. I like to really call myself more of an artist advocate um, uh, and, and really speaking about, you know, the conflicts, but, but just how war creates an unstable environment and it really ripple, ripples beyond borders, no matter which border it is. Um, <clears throat> so that concludes that. Um, excuse me. So you, I have some shows that are coming up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. This is actually Katsi Villapon. She is the founder of Laos in the House. And she has such an eloquent way of talking 
about real anything. But one of the things she talks about is, and I quote from her, is the trauma of a war isn't easy to talk about, but in hiding it, that history becomes forgotten and misunderstood for future generation. This turns into questions about identity, not knowing what to ask and whom to seek those answers from. We believe the art is a link to initiating dialogue. And if you are more interested in them, there's the blog there. Um, I am going to be part of a show called Thank You, No Thank You. Um, and it is, uh, it's 2020 is Mark's 45th anniversary anniversary for the end of the Vietnam War. So it's a very significant date for the Southeast Asian diaspora of Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodians, and people who left and resettled in America or elsewhere. Um, and so that statement, thank you, no thank you, is reflecting the expectations of being a good immigrant and an ungrateful refugee. And so the bomblet pieces are going to be going to the show, which is going to be at the Asian Art Initiative in Philadelphia. And um, if you want to know more about the Asian Art Initiative, you can definitely look them up a little bit more. Um, they were organi organization founded in 1993, responding to community concerns about growing racial tensions between African American and Asian Americans. So they cr they are ongoing. Um, I, I would like to say nonprofit who are tailoring towards the community and trying to connect people together. Um, Another uh, uh, show that I'm going to be in, I was asked by Chanita Potter. Uh, she's the founder of Seed Project, which is uh, acronyms for Southeast Asian Diaspora. Um, she's also the founder of Little Laos on the Prairie. Yes, I said it, Little Laos on the Prairie. Um, it's based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And their mission statement is uh, literary and visual storytelling and redefining what community development looks like for Southeast Asian diaspora. Um, they believe in storytelling as a powerful tool on how we get languages. Language is the entry point that keeps us rooted in our peoplehood. <clears throat> and I wanna say that being part of this show that's supposed to happen since all the crazy has happened is from September, 2020 to January 21. Um, the works are going to be, uh, it's going to have a community exhibition component to it. Um, and uh, there are four leading artists and also uh, uh, they are collecting stories. Seed collects stories from all over the country and actually from different continents as well, from immigrant and refugees and collects them. And so does um, uh, Laos in the House. So this so being part of two amazing group um, and ending it like that is um, from 2016, uh, meeting them um, at the Lao Rider Summit and then being a part of this community, but artist community, but also, you know, thinking about how, um, how that all just happened just from one conference just blows my mind. So my work has definitely taken a turn in terms of, you know, it not just revolving in a general way, but more about, um, about integrating my own story into my own work and, and sharing it with the, the rest of the world. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, <laughs> I think we come to an end. So this is a picture of Napoleon Bobcat. And I want to say a huge thank you to Shannon, the gallery director, Professor Carrie Watson, the curator. And uh, I think Heather was the tech in the PR. And I think there's another new person as a PR and uh, University of Central Florida and the NEA. And if you are more interested in my work, there's my website, um, IG as Sisvan Putabong, Facebook as Sisvan Houghton. So that concludes it. I know I went a bit fast and if you have questions questions, uh, please do ask, um, but thank you. Thank you so much, Sisavon, for sharing your incredible and powerful story um, about your family and personal experiences and how that connects to your, your beautiful work. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time to, to share, share all of that with us. Um, I did make a post in the chat. It, um, as you guys are here, still want to appreciate <coughs> Manet, please feel free to add questions to the chat. I do have a couple. We'll get started with the questions here. Um, could you discuss the relationship between the aesthetic qualities and historical content of your work? 
Oh, aesthetics. Um, the aesthetic qualities. Well, I think the aesthetics go back to my big influence at the University of Kansas. I was, I had many uh, art professors who came out from California. And so they were abstract expressionist artists. And so my work was really um, uh, definitely influenced by their ideas and their work as well. And so aesthetically, I, I like to say I'm an abstract expressionist that has a very kind of automatic quality of working and fusing some of the futuristic qualities in my work as well. Um, and then what was the second one? Was that, did I answer that? Yeah, it, it was really just connecting <clears throat> aesthetic qualities and the historical content. Of okay, it. yeah. And the next question really is kind of supporting a continuation of that one. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, your work is abstract, but also very political. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the tension between form and content? Yes, I think one writer I had wrote about my work at when the, uh, what was it, um, one of the, anyway, I forget, but he was talking about how my work was related a little bit to Guernica's, uh, Picasso's um, a piece where it is, that piece in particular is talking about war. Um, the jaggedness and things like that, the quality again is, is there's nothing fluid. So I feel as though, that is a, a direct representation both to the bombing and the shards and the debris and also the feelings that I get in terms of um, just who I am as a person and growing up in a, a two culture world and it colliding with each other. So both aesthetically and formally um, and also the color usage, the color is actually influenced a lot by the textiles of the Laotian textiles, which actually is very bright and colorful and, and very um, complicated. And my mom being a weaver, I was definitely highly influenced by that. And when she passed away, she left a lot of the textile um, and the dresses and the fabrics and things like that. And so it definitely inspired me um, to create work that was uh, uh, part that the color usage was part of my culture as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think there's definitely a strong connection with textile reference and even architecture, which is really interesting, you know, through abstraction. Um, we have another question. They say they're really interested in the notion of homelessness and the refugee experience. Yes. Can you talk about what it's like to live <clears throat> in Turkey? Well, Ooh, homelessness, you know, the first, we, when we moved to Winfield, Kansas, I remember because again, I was so little, we cram packed, I think like nine people, let's see, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 people in a very small home. And we weren't homeless and the, the local Baptist church helped us out quite a bit. Um, but in a sense that it, it's still, you know, that, that, compound of all these bodies in this space you know in this place and um uh, and 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 i don't think it was really any different from the refugee camps and so when i say homeless i'm really or maybe you know a sense of place is that uh, going back to the symbolism of of being an immigrant and really not really feeling like you always fit it fit in. It's not uh, not so much literal as that we don't have a home or a place to live, but more of a, a sense of mentality that that sense of space within our own head, um, there's no solidity in it. Does that make sense? Definitely. And, you know, even questioning how we define home and yes. what, what constructs that definition and how that's different for everyone based on their experience. Right. Definitely. Um, we have another question um, referencing the bombing tragedy. Is there a cinematic representation of this tragedy that you recommend? Oh, there is. I think in one of the clips I had on there, um, I put the video. Um, uh, there's a YouTube clip that was created um, uh, by Chanapa. And uh, if you just Google Legacy of War, you'll find all sorts of clips that they have they use for PR and things as well. But yeah, definitely you could you could uh, you can research that. Thank you so much. I, um, I think that that is the last one from our group. I'll give you guys a minute if there, there's anybody um, in the group who has a question for Sisavon. <coughs> 
Um, but I am curious to revisit what you, uh, the term that you said you recently have learned about and kind of exploring. And I'd be interested in knowing how you identify with that term of the 1.5 generation and what that means for your work. Well, it, um, it definitely fits me perfectly. And I think it was coined more for if, if I did a little bit more digging for um, Hispanics. Um, and so in a sense, I didn't really know about it, but um, uh, I, I've always felt maybe a lot of my work is part of that already and not knowing that, you know, it's part of the 1.5. Um, I made pieces when I was younger, that uh, a little house piece that was constructed um, for photography class and I took photos of my parents and then I videotaped them watching wrestling um, and constantly wrestling on at home. And I create, I, I filled bottles with, um, with rice and let it ferment and and there were tubes coming out of it to nothing because it was talking about how this my parents would go to work they would go to social events on this on the weekends and then they would um then they would watch wrestling so there was no like you know how are you today and how what's going on and you know and hey can we talk more about you know the history of of, of laos and so there's you know this constant need to get information but they are not interested in it because it's such an open wound and i think the 1.5 is such a um such a uh an experience well not experience but being part of that group and understanding that you know you're trying to be american but yet you have you know your laotian so the the culture the home life the you know, and then you leave the, the door and then you're becoming somebody else and you just want to be this American girl who, you know, plays volleyball and, you know, and, and, and other things. And so I think that that in a sense, in terms of how it will become part of my work, I don't think it's ever been um, disconnected. I think I just didn't know how to categorize it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I ha and I hadn't heard of that term until today either. So thank you so much for, yeah. for doing that. Um, so I think that this concludes our, our q and I want to thank you again so much, Sisavon, for taking your time to do your artist talk virtually. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for sharing, again, your incredible story and your beautiful work. And thank you for sharing um, so many of the communities um, that you have connected with, you know, that are continuing to advocate for, for, um, for Laos, right? Mm -hmm. And also, thank you for sharing your upcoming exhibitions and opportunities and congratulations on, on participating you. in this. And I would like to take a minute now to thank all of our audience. We had, I think, about 40 people here today with us joining us for the talk. So thank you all for, for joining us and supporting the Big Read programming. And um, thank you so much, and you all have a great day. Thank you. Be safe.